In our lifetimes, as limited as they are, we have seen the religious landscape change. Even more than that, we have seen religions themselves change. We have seen the Pope reach out to different groups in a way that popes had not done, have not done in times past. Many churches are now becoming more accepting of certain lifestyles, which they had not done in times past. Many denominations are becoming more fluid in their doctrines, choosing rather to focus on more social outreach. All of those things make one ask the question, should Christianity change to keep up with the times? I wanted to talk about that on this week's episode of Ears to Hear. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. As usual, I'm John Hines. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ here in Columbus, Indiana. My co-host... And I'm Andrew Walker. Andrew, good to see you. Good to see you, John. And again, appreciate everyone joining us for this week's podcast. As mentioned in the intro, we're going to be thinking about should Christianity change? And I would say most folks in the religious, however you want to put it, Christendom, the religious landscape, they would answer that question with a resounding yes Mm -hmm. in all likelihood. So in in thinking about what the Bible says and thinking about whether or not Christianity really should change, I thought we might begin just with the notion that God's law has changed um, down through the ages. And that very thing is actually spoken about in Hebrews chapter 7. In Hebrews chapter 7, and of course Hebrews, we have quite a few different betters. We have better promises. We have a better mediator. We have a better covenant. We have all of those things. And one of the places it talks about it, it says in Hebrews 7 at verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Mm -hmm. And I thought we might just begin there just because it shows that God's will. People will say, well, you know, God doesn't change. Right. And that's certainly the case, that that God does not change. But that does not mean that God's law has not changed down through the ages. And we have what, what it points to is different dispensations. And you have the patriarchal dispensation, and then you have the mosaic dispensation, and then you have the Christian dispensation. And you have God's commandments within each of those dispensations was, you know, in the patriarchal time, he's dealing, you know, with individuals, individual patriarchs, whether it's Job, whether it's Noah, Abraham, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tell Abraham to build an ark. He tells Noah to build an ark. He tells Abraham to come out. Now, there may be similarities with each one, but you have God dealing with them more individually. Well, then you have the Mosaic Law. And this is where I think sometimes people have trouble. But Hebrews makes it pretty clear there's there's a change. There's Old Testament and there's New Testament. So then the question is why? Why why the change? Why does God change the law? Right. Why does he change the covenant? Right. And you know, I think if you look back even as far back as the patriarchal era where God was dealing individually directly with um you know his his people his his chosen family uh even then god was giving indications of what his ultimate plan was right. so even in the patriarchal dispensation you had uh the the intent was to bring about the nation of israel which would be the old law you know they would be under that old law so there was reference to that in that same era there was also reference to the promise which ultimately would be christ so and the law pointed to that as well. So both of the preceding ways that God uh, gave his law to his people, which, yes, did change, still was one plan and one right. focus. Right. It's all a part of the same thing, and, it, and it's all pointing forward towards, like I said, the Messiah. Right. 
and what the Messiah was going to do. So that was the reason for God, you know, God's revelation. You know, I'm just thinking of in Galatians when it talks about the law was their tutor, our tutor to right. bring us to Christ. And it, it had a purpose pointing towards Christ. But I, I thought we might just start there just because it shows there were changes, but it's not as though, for one thing, they were contradictory. Mm-hmm. And it's not as as though, do, does that imply then that God's law will always be changing or was it pointing towards was it pointing towards something great that now we find ourselves in right well even another key difference um, when you look at people who think today that the church needs to keep up with the times or the church needs to reinvent itself or rebrand itself the the key difference there is that it's people who decide hey we ought to change things up right but in both of the times when you know, when God gave the old law and when God then did away with the tutor of the law and, and had the new dispensation under Christ, that was God's direction. Right. It was not man's decision that, okay, we're ready for a change. God was the one who decided when the change was going to take place. And even in eras under the old law, you know, you you found times under certain kings when they said that they would observe a feast and they hadn't observed the feast in that way since the time of Joshua or they hadn't observed right. the feast since, you know, some, yeah. some preceding generation. Right. And that is evidence to the fact that the law didn't, re- the way they should have kept the law didn't change. Now, they dropped off several of the traditions or things that they should have done under the law. Yeah, they weren't keeping it. <laughs> they weren't keeping it. And that's why it was a point of, that's why it was a point to bring up when they actually reverted to the original intent of the law uh, right. was because God's law didn't change for them. Yeah. And we're going to read a passage at some point in our studies today, and it's going to be in the conversation about marriage where Jesus takes it all the way back to the garden. Right. And he says it changed effectively to paraphrase it. He says it changed in the times of Moses because of the hardness of your hearts. He says, but, but, but from the beginning it was not so. And he takes it all the way back to the garden, mm-hmm. how God originally meant it. So Hebrews chapter 1 at verse 1, I wanted to read this verse as well within this point. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Now, he has spoken to us through his Son. In times past, it was one way. Now it's another way. Now what... If, if people are going to say, well, Christianity should change, and I think this goes to your point, in times past when it changed, it was because God directed it. Right. And now are we has God directed us to change again? Or has he spoken to us through his son and what we read about in Scripture? And that's the thing. Most of these denominations, they'll, they'll still at least claim to follow the Bible and yet in the at the same time they'll say but we need to change mm-hmm. and it's well has the Bible changed right yeah it, it's it goes back to the discussion we had last week where we talked about how the important thing that distinguishes whether a church is is right or not is is the Bible the basis on which they right. they make decisions and the basis on which they worship and decide how they do what they do and so all of these you know ways that we might try to modernize it's 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 man's intention trying to guess their way through what should be done and and pick their best guess it may be well intentioned but it's not using the bible as the guide it's using our own judgment right yeah very much so so people say well the church needs to change christianity needs to change it needs to get with the times because the times they are a changing obviously right. Okay, and that's that's the argument. Well, it needs to keep up with the times. Okay, so to look at that argument, so we're assuming that the times have changed. So I thought what we might do next is let's revisit what things were like, you know, 2,000 years ago and see how much things have really changed. And I understand there's, you know, we have modern conveniences and things like that. But a lot of the changes that take place in denominations today involve things like lifestyle choices. Andrew, what did they have such things as that back then? They they certainly did. And it was uh, even 
prevalent in the culture that they lived in. Uh, may have been worse back then. <laughs> may, may have been more pervasive. Um, you know, questions of morality and questions of the ways that people lived, uh, there, was, there was plenty of immoral practices in, in the Roman Empire um, and just and all the other kingdoms that existed at, at that time, even going back further, you know, to the nations that were around Israel. They were, right. they, they had a lack of moral, uh, a lack of moral clarity or, or yeah, moral character, however you want to put it. Yeah. And that's exactly why, you know, God, I mean, they directed were, his people to be different. They were sacrificing children to their gods. That's what they were doing in the Roman empire. It was acceptable to have what they called a catamite, I believe was the name for it. And what that was, was men would have a young boy to serve as their personal, for their personal, hmm, however you want to put it, sexual gratification. And it was accepted. And it's, I mean, it was morally reprehensible. People think that the lifestyle choices today, such as homosexuality and homosexual marriage and things like that, they think that it's a new thing. Like, no, it's not a new thing. It has been going on, frankly, since time began that people have been been practicing those things. Um, another thing that I wanted to touch on was the idea of, well, you, you can worship however you want to. Well, that was happening in Jesus's day. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what idolatry was. Right. You had worship whichever God you wanted to, worship however you want to. Well, is, is Christianity, you know, when Paul gets to Athens, he doesn't say, hey, that's okay. Just do whatever you want to do, you know, but that was the landscape. It was, you could worship however you want to the point where they had an idol, even to the un, the unnamed God. You had one of, one of the issues today is gender role issues. Well, that was happening back then. And you have, you know, there's a reason that when Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he talks about, let your women remain silent in the churches and it goes to gender role issues issues and that was happening 2000 years ago abortion was happening 2000 years ago here's here's the no-brainer was there political upheaval 2000 years ago yeah absolutely uh, all this stuff was happening marital issues is divorce a new thing it's not a new thing it's been going on forever um what else was, would be on my list I think one was just work issues, just the idea of being busy, being overly busy. And that was, that was happening. My, my point with all that is when people say, well, Christianity should change to keep up with the times. Well, have the times really changed? Yeah. I mean, the, the point of all of this is someone who would argue that the church needs to change its practices would say, you know, oh, look at, you know, look at these laws that we have now or look at um you know what's what's common now and the bible doesn't address that so maybe we need to do something that does address it but when we look into each one of these categories there is usually specifically something that points to that in scripture whether it's like you said about being busy you know jesus talked to uh those who were rich who had many possessions right. and they they had issues with the cares of the world weighing them right. down so that they couldn't serve him if you take the time to look there's there's really nothing in today's society that can't right. be addressed in the the words of scripture yeah very much so and and i think you hit on it right there if you take the time to look yeah and that may be part of the problem or if they do take time to look they don't like they don't like what they see because scripture's pretty it's matter of fact about it about a lot of these issues yeah and it's it's a more comfortable position to allow the culture to dictate what the messaging is going to be because then you don't have to disagree with anybody right. and and then and it's not that we're choosing to disagree it's that they're in disagreement with scripture and one has to win uh, when there's a conflict there between people's people's motivations and people what people want to do versus what scripture says that has to be reconciled either the person decides no i'm going to take precedence and in that case they ignore scripture or scripture is observed and honored yep very much so in, in studying up for this question some people take the view that in looking at history and that you look at the church and of course scripture 
Well, all of Scripture was written by, I don't know, 70 or 80 or 90 AD, within that first century. Mm -hmm. And then you have 30 or 40 years where supposedly you have no writing, and then all of a sudden you start having writing in 120, 130. And all of a sudden it, it doesn't look like it did in the first century. And then as the second century progresses and the third century progresses, and it looks very different from what was happening in Scripture, and people will see that and they will say, well, that, that serves as an example that the church can change, that it changed back then, and therefore it can still change. Now, the problem with that argument is Scripture actually prophesies that there would be those who depart from the faith. And that change that is recorded historically is exactly what Scripture said was going to happen. Right. And it's not condoning it. Yeah, it's it's condemning it. They warn against it. The, the whole premise of that is, is really kind of a flawed mode of reasoning. You're saying, well, the church has changed before, therefore it's okay for the church to change. But that argument relies on that first statement being that the fact that the church changed before was okay and right. that that was something that was condoned. That premise is false, so right. you can't justify changes today because it's been done before. And, and, you know, we talked about what happened in the Old Testament and how many times, you know, does it talk about, well, he walked in the ways of his father and did evil just like his father did. Right. Well, well, just because dad did it, does that make it okay? Uh, no. <laughs> No, just because there's a precedence for something does not necessarily mean it's it's justified. In First Timothy four, it says, and it's pretty blatant about it. The Spirit expressly says, verse one: In latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. That idea, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods, there are still religions and religions that started in the 3rd, 4th, 5th century that are forbidding to marry, talking about Catholic doctrine and the celibate priesthood. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that in Scripture where it's commanded to be celibate? They, they make that claim, and yet they say Peter was the first pope, which he wasn't. Peter was married. So, right. anyway, kind of defies logic a little bit, but this is what the Spirit revealed was going to happen. You were going to have the falling away. And later on in Scripture, it talks about the same thing. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about do we, do we adhere to the truth or not? There's a reason that the Apostle John, in 1 John, when he says, test the spirits, whether they are of God. And he's talking about this very thing. We're talking about teachers and teaching. And how do you do that? How do you test the spirits if the Bible is fluid? I mean, if, if, the, if, if the whole thing's just fluid and doctrine doesn't matter, how do you test the spirits whether they are of God? Right, because, you know, there's there's no consistency then. And, you know, God would say through his scripture, he would warn against those who would even come claiming additional revelations that that, right. that wouldn't be yeah. the case. And, and he even includes the apostles in that. In Galatians 1, if we, or an angel from heaven, if we teach any other doctrine, let us be accursed. Mm -hmm. Woe to us, we're anathema. Scripture prophesied that this was going to happen. So when people say, well, the church should change because the church changed in times past. There, there's actually, I was working on a, on a sermon today. And when, again, when John talks about this, and actually it's here in 1 John chapter 2, and he talks about this falling away that was going to happen. And he says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. <laughs> if they would have been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made, that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So when people say, well, yeah, but, but they started with the apostles. They started with the church. You're right. They did. Right. But they did not maintain. <laughs> they did not stay with the church. Yeah. They departed from the truth.
And Scripture said this was going to happen. So it all, when people say, well, the church needs to change to keep up with the times, the times have not changed. And frankly, it makes us ask the question, why would we want, why would we want Christianity to change? And how, what does it really come down to, Andrew? I think it comes down to either, either I want to do something that is contrary to scripture, so I need the doctrine of scripture to change to accommodate me, or I'm not comfortable with scripture where it disagrees with what man wants, so I try to reconcile the two so that I don't have to be caught between two ideas. Um, I, I think those are kind of the, the motivations for that. With, with regard to the second idea, God doesn't need us to apologize for him or for right. the words that he's given. Um, he doesn't need us to cover for him or, uh, you know, explain sugarcoat explain it. away, yeah, sugarcoat or explain away what he said. And people don't even sugarcoat it anymore. They just ignore they it altogether. Just, they just flat out, you know, will right. say say the opposite. Yeah. Um, but Paul, you know, in, in Romans, he, in the first chapter was talking about, he said, I'm under obligation to both Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you and to those who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's saying there that he's not going to apologize for it. He's not going to hide it. He's not going to keep it to himself. He's he's tasked with preaching the gospel, and so that's exactly what he's going to preach. And it's not going to be from him or through the filter of his opinion. It's going to be uh, what God has said. And that's the only thing that's important to him. He says that in verse 18 of chapter 1, the unrighteous of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So right. it, it it is unrighteousness that motivates us to say, we know what the truth is, but we're going to cover that up or we're going to ignore it or we're going to rewrite it so that it's more palatable to today's society. And God, God doesn't give room for any of that. But that's what folks try to do. It's it's and the it's, easier thing to do because then, you know, we can we can go on comfortably either with our own sin of choice or right. we don't have to uh, we don't have to engage with other people when they're living contrary to God's word. Yeah, and it you know I think it's interesting that it's it depends on your perspective about because it is easier to do because it allows for everything. Right. But at the same time, you're trying to hit a moving target. And hitting a moving target is not easy. And when you, you know, just for example, if you're a, a young person in the church and you say, okay, what do I need to do in this situation? And 10 years later, you ask the question again, and it's a different answer. That would be very hard, I would think, to reconcile in your mind. And it, it's hard to hit a moving target. So in one way, I'm th I'm thankful for the standard. Right. Because it doesn't move. <laughs> and you know it's not to say that if we learn better in yeah. our in our later right. years that we can't make a change. We can we, we can should be taught change. wrong and we should if we find that we were right. taught wrong or we learned wrong or we are growing. We were contrary to the word. Right. But in those scenarios it's it's not that man moved the target and now we have to meet it. Right. The target has always been what God has said. So right. if we are distant from it, we can always know when we're apart from that. But just like you're saying, if if culture or if mankind is able to influence what God wants of us, then then we can't then then God's word alone cannot tell us how we need to change. Yeah. Very much so. Matthew nineteen was the passage I referenced earlier in talking about talking about marriage. Matthew 19, and I mean, this is the Pharisees come to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? He answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. 
And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case, man, with his wife it is better not to marry. And I wanted to read that scripture just because it's pretty matter of fact yeah. that when people have marriage questions, and there are a lot of people, I would say most denominations, the vast majority do not recognize what that passage just said about there is one reason for divorce. He doesn't even say you have to get divorced. Mm -hmm. But when he talks about there's except for sexual immorality, most, the vast, vast majority would say, well, eh, just whatever the reason is, that's fine. That's not what Jesus said. And people can try to, that people can ignore it all they want to. It doesn't change what he said about marriage. The same passage, we could talk about gender, gender issues and things like that. When he says he made them at the beginning, male and female, I think anymore I've seen how oh, the number of genders there are that the world is recognizing at this point. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that in the last few weeks? And it's, I mean, it's some unreal number. It's like over a hundred. Right. I, I don't know what and it's what the agency, if there's an official count or not. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's just, what are we doing? And the Lord says, in the beginning, it was, this is what it is. It's male and female. Now, do you have to believe it? No. We're just saying this is what Jesus said. This is what Scripture says. And that's the point. This is what Scripture says. Have you not read? Mm -hmm. And we're back to that idea. When the Sadducees come to Jesus and they're talking about the resurrection and he says, you don't know, he says, you don't know scripture and you don't know the power of God. And there Paul is and he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God right. unto salvation. Yeah. And, and I was just thinking about in, in preparing for this, for this podcast, the Sadducees were the, the changelings of the day. They were the changers just because they would, you know, they adopted more of the Greek culture and they turned away from so much of the Old Testament hmm. and they didn't even really believe Jesus says, you don't even really believe the first five books of the Old Testament as much as you may claim to, but they were the ones who would change with the time. Right. Yep. And the Lord flat out condemns them. And the bottom line is, is, is like you said, the reason that people want Christianity to change is because they themselves don't want to change. And that's repentance. That's what repentance is. It's thinking differently. And people don't want to think differently, so they think the institution, whatever it is, should adapt to them. And what a mess. Yeah. <laughs> what, it's, just, it's just an absolute mess. Yeah, it, it is always when we find ourselves in disagreement with God or in disagreement with scripture, it is always us that needs to yield. Yeah. And it is always us that needs to stop what we're doing and see how, how do we need to change? Yep. Because God's word does not change. Yeah. It, you know, one more just comment I'll throw in while I've been thinking about this, um, you know, to someone listening to, to both of us, it might sound like, I know, I don't know, just you can picture two old guys sitting around and, oh, I don't want anything to change. And, oh, I, nothing should change. And it just sounds like we're a couple of grumps. Get off my lawn, Andrew. We've been, we've, we've been talking some, I think, recently in some episodes and certainly in uh, we'll get to it in our current Bible class, adult Bible class that we have going on. But on the topic of, you know, it, it made me think of like the subject of, of new songs that get written or new hymns. You know, I, I know, John, you're not one. Don't say it. Don't know, put it out on the air. <laughs> <laughs> you have some different opinions on some new songs, but, and people are entitled to their opinions. But when it comes to the, the idea of liberties and binding liberties, I know this is a whole different discussion. But yeah. it, it's not to say that, that there can never be uh, things, things that are done in, in maybe a, a way that utilizes some of the change in the world. The fact that we're speaking we're to you, we're going to talk for another half an hour on this. Now I'm opening, opening up a whole new. I'm can opening of up worms. a whole new topic here. I'll get off this soapbox because your point is is the, that in matters of liberty we can change. We can change within can, liberties. It is fluid. Yes, the very fact that that we're coming to you now through the medium of a podcast um, is 
is the fact that we're able to use the change, some of the change that has come about in the world, um, and and use it for the work of the church. So, um, you know, we we do want to make that distinction that certainly it's it's in matters where God has given His word and has right. given His command for His people. Um, that's where that's where we need to pump the brakes as soon as we think we need to update or or uh, give God a new coat of paint. Yeah, very much so. And that that's actually a very good point that, you know, as you had Jewish Christians, you had Jews who had converted to Christianity, but they were still keeping some of the things from the old law. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden, as they're going to be dispersed amongst the Gentiles and within that first and second century, they are going to, as they learn, I mean, the Lord concerning liberties, he does not want them to violate their conscience. But, you know, when he tells Peter, rise and eat, and Peter says, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And the Lord says, don't you call what I've cleansed unclean. Now, does that mean Peter went downstairs and had a barbecue sandwich? Probably not. But as he understood more, you know, when Paul talks about it, he says, to the Gentiles, to those without law, I became as one without law. He's talking about in the realm of liberties. Right. And that life changed. And in matters of liberty, if we traveled, and we made this point, I think, in the last last week's, last week's episode or the one before, different cultures will have different traditions. Sure. They're not violating God's law. It's just the reality of the situation. And if a person were to travel around the world, they would find themselves probably changing, not in in these matters of liberty. And that's okay. Yep. In matters of liberty, we change. Yep. We can be flexible. We can be accommodating. Yes. We don't accommodate, and we're not flexible to tolerate sin where God right. has called it out. And that's yep. the distinction. Yep. Very much so. Excellent point. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, John. Appreciate you. Hope everyone has hope everyone has a good week. We appreciate you joining us for this conversation, this study as it is. Thank you very much, and we hope you join us next week for another episode of Ears to Hear. Thank you for being with us today.